Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Review of Physical Sciences. Um, we're going to be talking about sort of the state of the school. And uh, while we're letting people join, I'm going to have this movie going for a, a little bit longer and then we'll get started. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, while we're getting set up, I just wanted to point out there should be a question and answer box that you that you have access to. And this will be the way that you can ask me questions. Um, because of current situation with Omicron, we decided to do this remote. And uh, the best way we have to do that is with this kind of one way. So I can hear from you via text, uh, via this Q&A, and then uh, I'll try to answer those questions as best I can. Um, okay. Um, so anybody, welcome everyone um, to the School of Physical Sciences overview um, of 2021. Uh, it's really a, a fantastic opportunity to get to share with everyone things that are going on within the school um, and uh, be able to at least do my best to answer some questions via this Q&A box. Um, so big picture, uh, just to start off, you know, this year has been a little bit of a, again, not fully back to normal, but uh, doing our best to kind of get back in person for most of the year. We, we were more or less back on campus uh, in the fall of 2021. Uh, and of course, now we've kind of taken a pause and we're remote again until the end of the month. And we hope at the end of the month, we'll be able to go back to more normal uh, interactions after that. Um, you know, just as last year, and I think even more so, I think faculty have done a tremendous job on their research. Research has continued to thrive, and I'll, and I'll talk a bit more about research thrusts and overview as best I can tonight. Um, teaching in the same way, you know, again, it's been, I think, kind of amazing to see the way folks in this whole institution has responded to, to education here in 2021 after uh, coming out of a very difficult year. Um, we welcomed a bunch of new faces, including some new staff, who I'll talk about in a second, but two new associate deans and five new faculty have joined the school this year. So we continue to grow as best we can. Uh, we've launched a new office that we're very excited about, an office of access, outreach, and inclusion that I'll provide a little bit of an overview for. And we have a lot of good news. Uh, one of the things that was really exciting is an alumnus, uh, David McMillan, uh, won the Nobel Prize in chemistry this year. And uh, in, in that respect, the school now has three Nobel Prizes associated with it. Uh, and if, he was, of course, the first alum of UC Irvine to win the Nobel Prize. Probably not the last, but the first. And so that's that's something we can, we can claim here as part of this school. Um, let me just mention, uh, just to kick, uh, in the very beginning here, and I'll mention this again, we have a tremendous uh, group of supporters, uh, both internally and externally, who help us do what we do here. And it's very much appreciated when folks uh, donate to the school. Um, we are a nonprofit, of course. Uh, we're trying to do so many things, way more than we have funding to do, unfortunately. And really any amount of money that you can donate to the school, even if it's $10 in appreciation of a public talk, uh, et cetera, is actually very, very valuable for a lot of different reasons. Um, uh, donated money we can use to sort of jumpstart projects, um, to cover events, uh, student activities that aren't covered by grants um, and can be seed funding for exciting new research ventures that can turn into much larger things. And of course, uh, if you're interested in uh, getting your name on this school, uh, along with a few Nobel Prizes and some other stuff, uh, you are also welcome to do that. Uh, please feel free to call me at home anytime uh, if that's what you want to do for us. Uh, but anyway, so just reminding you of that, and I hope you'll continue to help us in that way. The state of the school, of course, is that the school is actually quite strong. Um, we've got a bunch of undergraduate students, 2,300 or so undergraduates, a very large graduate population uh, in this school. We're very strong in research and graduate education, uh, 625 odd graduate students, uh, PhD students mostly at any given time. Um, 
We are about 14% underrepresented minorities among our students with about 36% women. Um, and this is an area that we wanna diversify, of course. Um, and, we're, and I'll talk a little bit more about our efforts to do that. One thing I did wanna mention here with these statistics is that as many of you may know, a large uh, fraction of the students at UCI undergraduate students are first generation. So they're first and their uh, families to go to college. And 97% of entering students will take a course from our school, from the School of Physical Sciences. So we take that job very seriously. The educational mission is incredibly important for what we're trying to do here. And this is something that kind of underlies a lot of what we're trying to do. Um, we have four departments. Um, unlike a lot of schools uh, on this campus, um, a lot of schools have many um, different, um, uh, hold on a second, I think I've got a, so I think if you've got your hand raised, I can't see that. I just wanted to mention, if you have a question, the easiest way to do that is to um, go through the Q&A box. Um, so sorry about that if you're, if you're, if you're not seeing my, uh, if you're trying to ask a question, the Q&A box will be the way to, to do that with me, uh, for me to see it. Um, so yeah, we have these four large departments. So we kind of, a lot of schools uh, on this campus have many, many small departments, but we kind of have four large departments that cover chemistry, earth science, mathematics, and physics, and astronomy. Um, and uh, this is, creates a very interesting dynamic because there's sort of four separate kind of mini schools that are doing sort of related activities and uh, they're all working together. There's something, uh, sorry, they're not always all working together. And one of the jobs of the school is to try to see if there's coordinated activities that can help us talk more. But with such a large institution, uh, as many of you know, that's always something that we strive to do a better job of. We have 111 extremely dedicated and hardworking staff that enable everything we do. And about 167 faculty uh, right now who are doing this work. Now, each one of these faculty are not only teaching a lot of courses, but they are uh, doing research. And almost every one of them is writing multiple major papers every year on groundbreaking research. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we're trying to monitor and talk about. And what I'm gonna to try to do tonight is just give you some highlights and some examples of the kind of things that are gonna be, that are, that are happening in the research space. But of course, there's no way I could in one hour cover everything that's going on because there's just so much. And the more, if you want to learn about any of these specific things, please feel free to reach out. Um, one of the things we have invested a lot of time and energy on, though, is doing a better job of communicating all of the amazing things uh, that's that, are, that are happening in the school. And we have now a, a, a pretty amazing uh, communications team uh, led by uh, Tatiana Arizaga. Uh, so Tatiana has put together a team that includes Lucas Joel, who's a science writer, um, who, who has independently written for publications like the New York Times. In addition, we have four science communication fellows who are in fact PhD students in each of the departments. And they kind of bring some of the academic expertise in their subfields. And their job is to sort of find interesting stories and communicate them to the public. They play a role in running our social media and coming up with stories, writing stories, and communicating uh, those activities. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of those, um, some of those, uh, uh, the way that, the way they've done that, been able to do that uh, this year. Um, so one of the ways you can manifest this, if you're interested in seeing um, what's going on, the way they've, they're communicating this is on through our website. So if you go to our website and you click on news, you can click on videos and podcasts and news stories. And we now have a video series that talks about some interesting work, including something on carbon capture for climate change, uh, oil spill science for the oil spill that happened this year, and a number of uh, conversations we've had with various faculty and alumni and experts uh, in the area. Um, so it's worth checking that out. I'll mention also there's very active uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, Facebook pages that are all trying to communicate and talking about all of the interesting things that are going on in the school. So if you're interested in more and keeping up with what's going on, I really encourage you to do that. 
if you're an alum of the school, um, you might be amazed to sort of be able to track uh, things that are happening and things are changing in real time, even even you know over the next over months. I mentioned this earlier, but another thing that we've launched is a new office for access, outreach, and inclusion. And the idea behind this office really is to help coordinate and enable activities, many of which were already ongoing uh, in each of the departments to. Uh, increase diversity, equity, and inclusion, and really create communities, supportive communities within uh, the school. Um, we've, we, we have a, a grant for $500,000, which is to work on advancing faculty diversity within the school. Um, one of the amazing things is each of the departments, um, physics, uh, earth system science, and chemistry, they each have bridge programs uh, to enable graduate students from broad backgrounds to sort of enter graduate school here at UCI. And we're very proud of that official partners for um, the professional organizations. In addition to another bridge program called CalBridge, which brings in students from Cal State undergraduate schools into the, the PhD program here. Uh, and that involves, uh, again, many of the departments in the school. Another thing we've done is we have a set of uh, PhD diversity fellowships that we've uh, created that uh, allow PhD students to be supported for the activities that they, many of them were already doing uh, to, to cultivate culture and inclusion within uh, their departments. And one of the success stories here is that one of the groups in physics and astronomy called PACE actually received an additional grant on their own uh, funded by the American Astronomical Society to more or less double the money that we were putting into this kind of peer mentoring program that they had developed there. So there's a number of things we're very excited about that we're doing in this area. And like I said, a lot of it were things that folks were already doing on the ground um, in the departments, but they were kind of doing it on their own. And now we've, we're trying to lend support and structure to those activities. Um, the Office of Access, Outreach, and Inclusion is supported by a number of people. Primarily, uh, you know, one of the main additions is we now have Kara Ward on board as the program coordinator, and she works closely with faculty in all the departments uh, to help enable uh, a lot of different interesting activities that are going on in the school. Each of the departments also has a vice chair to help coordinate those activities. And Muchan Chen is the associate dean, uh, newly appointed associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and she is uh, sort of a point uh, academic leader on these kind of initiatives. In much the same way that Muchan is the associate dean that helps coordinate these kind of activities and leads sort of the academic mission on towards um, diversity, equity, inclusion, we have associate deans uh, that also help uh, within the school to um, enable graduate education, undergraduate education, and then research and innovation. And this leadership team together with uh, Maria Graziano, who is the assistant dean, uh, have really, um, you know, really enable a tremendous amount of success in this school and work incredibly hard to enable um, these amazing things that I get to talk about today. So I did want to acknowledge that. And so in much the same way, Muchan is helping to lead this kind of coordinated effort among the departments. There are similar uh, many, many activities that each of these <laughs> folks are doing to enable, you know, in their respective uh, domains. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we had the great news. Uh, we woke up um, uh, early in the morning on October 6th to find out that David McMillan had been uh, awarded the, the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Uh, and th this is just, uh, it was just a fantastic news. Um, I think that people who were paying attention in chemistry were not, oops, were not necessarily super surprised uh, that this happened, but um, it, it was quite a big deal, especially for us, uh, because not only uh, is uh, David's PhD advisor here on the faculty, that's of course, Larry Overman, uh, who's been a presence here and an, uh, a really uh, instrumental presence in, in success of the chemistry department over the years, 
was his PhD advisor, but his former PhD student, V. Dong, is also on her faculty. And there's a picture here of them uh, going out to lunch to celebrate uh, this big uh, award. Um, here's a picture of him in DC with one of our chemistry faculty members, Anne Marie Carlton, uh, doing the zot 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 there. So he's getting his prize and doing the zot zot zot. So that's cool. One of the really great things for me on the day he won the award is that um, the Twitter feed uh, for the Department of Chemistry, which again is is was run by this graduate uh, student fellow um, Maj, uh, he immediately explained the the significance of the award and the and the chemistry behind it, uh, which was of course great for me because everyone immediately started asking me, oh, okay, tell me about this big award that was just associated with UCI, and I had a I had the Cliff Notes uh, available right there on uh, Twitter. So that was useful. But anyway, this is another another thing that was fantastic about, I think, you know, demonstrating the excellence of this institution, because not only, of course, did we, uh, you know, one of our alums go on and do this tremendous, tremendously important work, but we're, we're there day of educating the public about what it means and its significance. And of course, there's a there's a tie in here that has to do with uh, environmentalism and, and green chemistry. Uh, that's important here that, that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. In fact, in that vein, you'll notice that, that Professor Carlton is there in DC uh, with uh, David McMillan to receive this prize. You might wonder, okay, it was in DC. What, did, she, did she fly out just for the award? Uh, the answer is no, actually, because she's actually spending the, the year in, in the White House. Um, she's part of the the White House Office of Science and Technology um, Policy. She's taken a year as a, as a Ravel Fellow in Global Stewardship, uh, where she's working on um, understanding how to limit or decrease greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. And she's been working on these kind of issues for a long time and is very pa passionate about it. This is a way in which our faculty sort of engage with the world and try to translate fundamental research to sort of solutions in a way that I think there's a great legacy of that uh, in this school and on this campus. Um, so uh, with that, I thought I would sort of transition a little bit into the, the programs, uh, our flagship research programs that we have. Um, I wanted to, at this point, pause for one second because I'm not noticing any Q&A. So I wanted to make sure and I'm seeing everything. Um, it looks like it looks like that I'm seeing a lot of them. So I'm going to start again. Sorry about that, but I just want to make sure I'm seeing everybody's questions in real time. Um, so I wanted to start with uh, the um, future of the energy and the environment. So we have four flagship programs that I'm going to touch on, which I can't broadly summarize some of the things we're most excited about in the school. The future of energy and the environment is one that correlates a bit with what Anne-Marie Carlton is doing. The future of fundamental science is another important area, the future of health and the future of quantum science. And these are areas that overlap a little bit with almost all of our departments. And this is a nice way of sort of talking a little bit about what we're all doing. The future of energy and the environment, of course, is has a, has a long history in this school with Sherry Rowland and, the, and the, the Nobel Prize for CFC depletion of ozone, and then uh, the legacy of Ralph Cicerone and the Earth System Science Department, which was the first of its kind. Uh, we continue to lead in that direction. Um, in particular, uh, we're doing tremendous work on new batteries. Uh, we continue to be uh, leaders in air quality with air UCI and of course climate change and there, we've had a few very large grants this year awarded to various faculty uh, in each of these areas of course. Um, something else we're really excited about is that we've spearheaded an initiative that now extends beyond the School of Physical Sciences to uh, effectively all schools on campus um, and that's what we call solutions that scale. So Solutions That Scale um, is an initiative where we've really tried to knock down barriers around this really important question and, and problem of climate change to, to embrace uh, a knowledge not only uh, among all academic 
uh, pursuits on this campus, but out into the community and in the private sector. Um, we are trying to build, in fact, one of the goals is to build collaborations with the private sector and policymakers where we can lend our voice to problems in a way and also learn from uh, these folks about what needs to be done. Um, and also accelerate understanding of humanity's impact on the climate and educate leaders, current leaders, existing leaders, and of course, future leaders as our students on this important area. And then importantly, to discover and enable, enable scalable solutions to this global problem. Um, you know, the, the idea then is to sort of figure out in a data-driven way, what can we do uh, and what are, what's the cost of doing certain things versus others to sort of figure out solutions. Um, as part of this, we're doing a lot of things that are really kind of grassroots on campus. A number of deans have chipped in a graduate student fellowships, and now we have these interdisciplinary solutions that scale fellows that are working across multiple schools towards interesting problems uh, in climate. So you've got engineers collaborating with earth scientists, collaborating with folks from public health, uh, and in various disciplines on campus. Another thing we do is we host a monthly seminar series uh, with people, both academics and uh, community leaders. Um, I'll point you to our website. Uh, if you just go to the Solutions at Scale website, you can see a lot of the stuff we're doing. The past talks are there on video. Um, in the, in Janu on January 20th, we have a, a really interesting talk coming up from Roger Ains. He's the energy uh, program chief scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and he's gonna be talking about um turning california's waste into hydrogen while removing co2 from the air so hydrogen of course being a, an energy a fuel um and then after that we have sona coffee coming up so sona is the environmental uh programs administrator for the city of irvine and you may know that the city of irvine is really showing tremendous leadership in this area and uh, she's going to be talking about sustainability and innovation in irvine and she's very interested in uh, leveraging all of the great uh, intellectual firepower on this campus towards initiatives on the on the scale of the city. So again, this is the kind of thing we're trying to do. We're doing more of it. We had a, a fantastic talk um, recently from one of our alums who uh, was at COP26 and is a leader in, in um, environmental space and will continue to build those kind of dialogues. There's so much to do in this area, and I'd love to talk to people more, but there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. If you want to uh, help us do something, this is a place where investment can really move the needle tangibly on a really important problem. And UCI is maybe the best place in the world to try to do it. Another area that's a real strength of this school is fundamental science. Um, and a great example of that is this tremendous experiment that's called Phaser um, that has been installed at CERN at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, you may know that there's only eight experiments at CERN. Um, many of them are many hundreds of millions of dollar experiments. And the newest one is called Phaser. It was created right here at UCI. Uh, Jonathan Fang uh, is the lead theorist and uh, behind it, we also have Professor David Casper in the physics department, who's sort of the experimental lead from UCI, but it has turned into sort of a multinational collaboration uh, where the primary initial science aim was to do science related to um, dark matter, but also dark forces. And But what's interesting is it also enabled some new kind of neutrino physics, and there's a great legacy, of course, of neutrino physics at UCI. And just recently, this team, the Phaser team, uh, announced the first um, uh, uh, signals for uh, detecting neutrinos um, uh, for um, at, at the Large Hadron Collider. And there's a lot of interesting uh, neutrino physics that uh, can be done uh, with this new Phaser experiment. And in fact, this result was quite a big deal. It got a tremendous amount of press. Scientific American did an expose, a great article in Inverse and Innovation, Newsweek, Forbes. It appeared on the 2021 highlights um, from CERN. So it just the you know one of the biggest discoveries at CERN last year again was this phaser result for neutrinos. And if you haven't seen it, we did a really cool event live from CERN uh, a few months ago um, in November. Uh, where we actually had 
a graduate student working with Jonathan who was down there in the tunnel and you got to sort of see her. She showed us phaser, talked about the physics, and we, we had a, a lot of great Q&A there uh, about the physics of, of phaser. So stay tuned because we're expecting more great things from that experiment again that was born and bred right here at, at UCI. The future of health, of course, is something that's a mainstay, I think, to a, a, a chemistry department like ours. I mean, it's a really flagship chemistry department here at UCI, and um, it, it really, um, it's something we've been doing a lot of for a long time. Uh, an example of this, we had a really fun, compelling conversation, which again, the video is up if you want to look at it, with V. Dong and Larry Overman, who I mentioned earlier, talking about drug development. Uh, and then also Matt Dickison, who's one of our alums, who's working in this area. And it was very lively discussion about somebody who's out in industry, trying to get a, a, you know, a drug through trials and doing really important work there. And then, of course, the folks on the ground in the chemistry department who are building these molecules and, and doing drug development from the chemistry side. Um, we recently had a, a, a story um, on chemical and engineering news. Uh, that was talking about this great work that um, Associate Dean and Professor Reg Penner and Professor Greg Weiss are doing to create dipstick type technology where you can detect bladder cancer in urine with just a dipstick kind of tech. And that, that this in principle um, may save many, many lives in the future because you can't, it's really hard to detect bladder cancer early enough to do anything about it. But this technology could really be a game changer. And this is a, another place where you take basic science, and then eventually it translates to, you know, saving lives in, in real time. And although it's sort of obvious to think about chemists as those who are doing uh, health-related research, it's not just the chemists in the school. A couple of great examples of, of physics enabling um, uh, medical treatments and saving lives are, are first with this company called TAE Life Sciences. And many of you know that TAE Technologies is a company that was founded on ideas invented by Norman Rostocker and his PhD student, uh, Michael Bindenbauer. Michael Bindenbauer is now the CEO. Um, now, TAE uh, Life Sciences is a spinoff company where they're working on radiation therapy initiatives. And um, it, it, it's a tremendous opportunity. They're actually already talking to folks over in health sciences at UCI, and we're hoping, they're hoping, and I'm all hoping that UCI will be able to host one of these machines, which would be really important for cancer treatment. Another type of technology that could also be very important for cancer treatment, focused now on x-rays, is uh, Lumatron. Um, Lumatron is a company that was founded by a, a different physics professor, Chris Barty, who's active now and they're building this thing out and uh, it's also just fantastic uh, and the, the goal here is to produce monochromatic x-rays x-rays that are tuned to a very specific energy that could then help identify cancers and even destroy them in one shot in principle and so we're very excited about those kind of imaging and treatment technologies that are spun out of basic sciences that have been come um, Another uh, related issue, uh, something else that we're doing in this school related to sort of health is this NSF Simons Institute for Multiscale Cell Fate. Uh, this is a collaboration between mathematicians who are using sort of mathematics, big learning and AI, partnering with folks in BioSci to enable again, sort of solutions that ultimately may or should have um, a medical, uh, um, uh, medical uh, payoff. Um, and so we have a question here from Kavan. Has UCR been doing anything fun with machine learning and AI uh, recently? There's a number of things. Um, I will, I'll come, of course, I'll mention, uh, I'll mention too quickly, this NSF Simon Center is definitely in that wheelhouse of using AI to sort of help with medical um, uh, treatments and imaging, et cetera. But of course, um, another place uh, where some really interesting advances are being made is actually back in fundamental science. Um, UCI has been a leader in using artificial intelligence approaches to identify interesting events at the Large Hadron Collider and in other kind of particle detectors. Um, and basically 
learning new physics with AI is something that is very exciting. Another place is implementing artificial intelligence and machine learning in climate simulations, where it turns out that one of the really hard things to do brute force in climate simulations is clouds. And um, it turns out that cloud modeling is something that you can use sort of subgrid simulations, apply machine learning algorithms and port those. So this is a place where, um, you know, our folks at Earth Systems Science Department, it's an area where we're leading as well. So we have something called a machine learning nexus in uh, physical sciences, where we bring folks who are using machine learning and AI approaches uh, in various subdisciplines and kind of get them together and talk. Uh, and of course, we have mathematicians who are developing a sort of the fundamental new ideas about how you can do machine learning better and faster. The primary way in which people are doing machine learning now is kind of with basic regression algorithms. The mathematics was really developed 20 years ago, and it's only the only reason why it's becoming uh, powerful today is that the computers are fast enough to run the algorithms fast. But there's hope that there's even smarter al algorithms where you can do really interesting AI, like just write directly on the phone that's in your hand, not with the cloud. And th those are activities like that that are spinning out of the mathematics department right now. So those are just a few. So thanks for that question. Be careful if you answer a question, ask me a question, because then I might talk for 45 minutes uh, uh, spouting off about stuff because it's so exciting. Um, so uh, another area that we're really excited about the future, you know, we think about what TAE has done, right? So TAE, many of you know, is this very advanced fusion company. They've spun off of this TAE, TAE life sciences company. Primarily, this was basic science stuff that was being done maybe 30 years ago that spun off into this, this really important groundbreaking efforts. The area where many people think we're going to be see those sort of fundamental seeds of new technologies that could spark an entirely new technological revolution is in quantum science. So this involves things, of course, like quantum computing and qubits, but also quantum materials and ideas like spintronics instead of electronics, uh, things like that. Um, now, this is one reason why we're very excited by a new institute that's been created and supported by uh, Roy Edelman called the Edelman Quantum Institute. It's brought together chemists and physicists and some mathematicians to sort of unite around the question of quantum science. This is being led by the director, uh, Bill Evans, who's done a tremendous job leading this sort of intellectual vision of this institute. And it's really amazing and actually unusual to see chemists and physicists talking to each other about these subjects. I mean, many of the times they don't speak exactly the same language and there's a little bit of translation that goes on. But one of the really amazing things about this is there are these now Edelman graduate student fellows, some physicists and chemists who get together regularly and talk to each other about what they're doing. And these are, these are PhD students who are working together and being interdisciplinary and driving research forward. So it's very exciting. And I hope to be able to tell you more great things about what's happening with the Edelman uh, Quantum Institute. Um, so, so Svetlana uh, is one of our mathematicians here who's, who's shown, um, she's part of the Edelman Quantum Institute, but she has been doing tremendous work. And I just wanted to mention this. She's really one of the premier mathematical physicists uh, in the world. She's giving a plenary talk at the International Congress of Mathematics this year. Um, giving one of these talks is tr extremely prestigious. Um, it's sort of on the level of winning a Fields Medal. It's very, very rare to give one of these talks, uh, a plenary talk like this. Um, and she has won lots of honors and a lot of the different kind of work she's doing in mathematical physics. And so this is just an area where we have expertise, you know, these, these sort of, and the mathematical, the basic mathematics of quantum science all the way through to direct experiment and different kinds of quantum materials, et cetera. So, it's amazing breath and a, a lot of really great things uh, that are going on there. Um, so with that, I do want to open it up a little bit more to Q&A um, about what we're doing, but I wanted to make sure I thank the advancement team who helped put together this presentation and enable this event, uh, Mariana, Sonia, and our, our new um, communicate office assistant uh, for advancement and communications, uh, Joanne uh, Jamora, who's joining us here on this call. So thanks so much for that. In particular, I do really want to thank Sonia, uh, who's just puts a tremendous amount of work into events like this. 
Um, before I go on and kind of open it up more generally to discussions, um, I do want to, again, sort of thank everybody who supported this school uh, at any level over the last uh, year. It's, it's, it's really been tremendously important uh, to what we've been able to do. Um, as you know, um, research funding is crucial, and a lot of what we do is based on government funding, which is great, and there's large sources there. But you kind of have to tell them exactly what you're going to do before you get the money, and then you have to do what you said you were going to do. So if you have a bright idea um, that's urgent, um, it's really hard to act on that in, in a short time frame because it's sort of a year and a half lag between when you propose and when you get to do it. And by that time, it might be too late or the field may have changed. And so support of, of sort of general kind like uh, you, could, you can provide in any way can be very helpful for innovation in that respect. And of course, educational activities and outreach activities uh, are also the kinds of things that would be wonderful to support. If you want to do any of that, please feel free to text to give with this number, or you can contact Mariana or Sonia at these email addresses, or me if you want to, uh, if you have specific ideas and want to hear more, I'd love to talk to you about that too. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to stop sharing and open back up just so that I can see everybody, and I will answer some of the questions that are popping up, and feel free to um, go ahead and, uh, and keep asking questions. Okay, so I'm back. So we do have a question here um, for um, what's next for Professor Fang and Phaser. So obviously I wish Jonathan was here and he could answer his question, this question directly, but I can try to tell you a little bit about what's happening. Um, so the next time um, the LHC goes live, they're gonna be taking lots and lots of data. Um, and they're hoping to learn more about the neutrino signals that they're detecting. But, but fundamentally, what they really hope to do is begin looking for evidence of dark forces. So things like dark photons. And really, you know, if you one of one of the interesting things that we understand now about the universe is something like five, six of the mass of the universe is actually nothing that's in the periodic table. And so if you think about that, we have this little slice of the universe that. Uh, is is only about a sixth of it. And that is all of the chemistry that we know about, all of the sort of um, uh, strong force, weak force, electromagnetic force, all that stuff is in that in that piece. But then this vast dark universe where uh, there were ideas in the past that there was basically one particle that made up all of that. But there are new ideas now that there's basically a dark sector where there are own forces and forces of nature in the dark matter and in the dark sector. And the phaser experiment is really designed to look for stuff like that. And so we're hoping that we'll see evidence there, which would be tremendous. Um, so hopefully I've done an okay job. And if, um, you know, Jonathan then can send me an angry email if I didn't get that quite right, but it's in that ballpark. They're hoping to upgrade phaser two. There's a phaser two in the works. Um, so, so Don Beal is asking, um, uh, if possible, say a word regarding TAE. Okay. Yes, of course. So I, I mentioned TAE. I think I, I, yeah, I think I did. I think I did get to Don's point there. I talked a little bit about, uh, TAE, but yeah, we're very excited about, uh, triathlon energy technologies and the future of fusion energy there. Um, if they're successful, um, you know, what, what they're hoping to do is, is produce, uh, energy via fusion uh, in a way that's different than the tokamak idea. Uh, and uh, if they're successful, they will have, they will be able to generate energy, you know, similar to what you do with a coal fired power plant uh, within the same electricity grid. So this would be completely green. Uh, you're not talking about having spent nuclear fuel or anything like that. You could have power plants that sort of replace coal fired power plants without rebuilding the electricity grid. So it would be amazing and successful. Um, um, let's see, let's, let's grab a few others. Um, oh, so John Evans is asking about, uh, curious about the web telescope and the impact for the school. So yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to talk a little bit about web. Um, many of you might know that I'm the chair of the users committee for the web telescope. This is the largest and most advanced telescope that 
uh, NASA has or and ESA or really the world has ever seen. Um, it was it was launched uh, basically on Christmas Eve uh, successfully. Um, and it was a great Christmas present there for a lot of astronomers all around the world. It was it went off without a hitch. A lot of us were holding our breath for a long time, but so far it's been right on schedule. The launch was perfect. In fact, they saved a lot of fuel because of the precision of the launch. And so now we think this thing could actually be operating for 20 years. Uh, it, was, it was designed minimally for six, and we might have this thing in space for 20. Um, it's something like 100 times more powerful than Hubble. And I'll just mention that our goal is to actually have an event focused exclusively on James Webb with me and a few of the other astronomers talking about that sometime in the next month or so. So that's in the works, so stay tuned. I'll just say we have a number of faculty who have observing programs on Webb during the first year. Um, there's exciting work being done on the nature of dark matter, on studying exoplanets um, and quasars and black holes. So, and, so you'll learn more about that, but it's gonna be tremendous for the school especially for our young faculty who basically will be able to use this thing for the rest of their career. Um, knock on wood, they're aligning the mirrors right now. So as it, what, this telescope is gonna be at L2, so beyond the moon, way out there, and it's on its way out there now. And as it's going out there, it's basically unfolding. It was folded up, now it's unfolding. And now the telescope is unfolded, but they're aligning the mirrors right now. And they have to align the mirrors incredibly precisely Right now it's seeing kind of cross-eyed and it's aligning the mirrors so that now it only sees one image and not like 16 different images and it's all stacked up. So we're holding our breaths that that alignment's gonna go well, uh, but so far it's been this incre another incredible engineering marvel. Um, you know, I, 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 like every time every time we land on, the, on Mars, every time there's a Mars mission, I always think, well, that's impossible. There's no way they're gonna be able to pull that off and they pull it off, right? NASA's incredible. With Webb, you know, I knew a lot of the people who were trying to build this thing, and they were really smart people. I knew it was the A team at Northrop Grumman building this thing, um, but still, <laughs> what they were trying to do is really hard. And so far, they've pulled it off. So, it's going to be exciting to see what Webb what Webb does. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, um, oh. With diversity and inclusion objectives, what is the school doing to increase the representation of women in sciences? And can you comment on how UCI is ranking versus other UCs? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so what are we doing? So we're, we're doing a lot in that space. Um, so we're, we're doing things, so there's sort of a few different issues here. So one of the things we're trying to do is work with um, kids. So start, and it turns out that around sort of sixth, seventh, eighth grade is, a, is an age range that shows where for one reason or another, girls start to be uh, less interested in science. They're kind of uh, maybe pushed away from it. They're societal norms. And so we have programs now, including a great one that Omoa Shields is running called Rising Star Girls, where she's working directly with these kind of um, with, with students at this crucial age, uh, with particular girls trying to get them interested more in uh, math and science at those ages. And that's been tremendous. Like she's a really compelling figure if you don't know Amawa. Um, at a slightly old, you know, there's also this program called Mass CEO where we're going into middle schools and younger schools and working directly with students trying to get a broad uh, group of diverse students interested in math and sciences. Um, at the graduate program, you know, these bridge programs and particularly the peer mentoring programs that we're building through the Office of Access and Inclusion uh, is a, a lot of that is aimed towards supporting women in science and recruiting more women into the graduate program. So there's sort of two pieces of that with PhDs. Um, it's re recruiting women into the PhD program, but also supporting them and making sure they feel comfortable and supported once they're here. Uh, and so those are two pieces. It's sort of the outreach and the in-reach piece that we try to work together. And a lot of that is with peer mentoring. So tiered mentoring with, for example, an undergrad is mentored or a, a freshman undergrad is mentored by a senior undergrad and the senior undergrad is mentored by a graduate student. And that junior graduate student is mentored by a more senior graduate student. So we have this tiered mentoring all the way up where we create these support networks uh, for students. And so these are programs that we're trying to build as well. And finally, I would say in our undergraduate classes, 
Uh, we have a number of really dedicated faculty who think a lot about how you teach effectively to uh, students of lots of different backgrounds. And so we work hard and we even have studies on how you present material in these courses and get more uh, women and minorities interested in science. So there's a lot to be done there, but I'm uh, very proud of, of a lot of the initiatives that are happening. Um, okay, uh, a few more, let's see. Um, Let's see. How are birthing parents supported in the School of Physical Sciences and are there procedures in place to help them succeed financially so that more women in science can thrive? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that we work really hard on, of course, if you're faculty in science, there's at UCI, there's a, there, there's a pretty strong um, parental leave uh, opportunities in place. And so that's, that's a place where if your faculty, you're in a pretty good position to be supported if you're having kids and, and people. So that is, a, that is an area where I feel pretty good about what we're doing. For a graduate student, it is harder, although I would say that it's quite, our faculty are quite supportive, the PhD advisors are quite supportive. One of our more successful graduate students recently who just got a UC President's postdoctoral fellowship and moved um, to Riverside, had a child while she was a PhD student. She was able to take leave while she was a PhD student, uh, come back, be successful, um, and was supported that whole time. You know, we continued to pay her, and she took that leave and ended up being successful in that way. And that's something that you know we're working towards figuring out. The roadblock here, in a harder place, I think, is for postdocs. Uh, for postdocs, it's a little bit harder because that time frame is shorter. And those are sort of by definition, short-term jobs where you have to build a resume in a really short amount of time to then jump over. Uh, one of the things I'm really proud of is one of our former postdocs here, a guy named um, Marcel Pulowski was actually a Hubble fellow, which is one of the most prestigious postdoctoral fellowships in all of astronomy. He was actually an advocate for um, getting, allowing NASA to sort of take its most prestigious fellowship and put pressure on institutions to enable financial uh, or parental leave for those postdocs, and that has worked. And so a lot of this stuff has been ground up uh, to get sort of big institutions to help put pressure on other institutions. And I would say, um, not only is UCI as an institution sort of helping and leading the way in this, but our, the actual scientists who are here are voices of advocacy that are helping putting pressure on sort of more national institutions to enable this kind of stuff. And it's been great. And I would say there's a couple postdocs and, and like I said, graduate students who've had kids in this school and they've been very successful and supportive. Um, so, okay. Um, let's see. Um, what else do I, what other questions do we have here? Um, what is the best way to support UCI School of Physical Sciences without donating? Uh, you can volunteer. Um, we have a, um, if you want to be a mentor, for example, you can contact, um, you know, you can just send an email to PS Dean and, and express to me interest in being a mentor. That would be a great way. You could spread the word uh, about how great we are <laughs> and all the fantastic work we're doing. Um, and there might be other ways that I can be creative about. So if you wanna, if you wanna help in that way, uh, let me know. Um, let's see what else we have going on here. Um, uh, any other questions that people wanna ask? I mean, there's a question here. Um, oh, is UCI teaching students fast enough to keep up with accelerating technologies, industrial practices? That's a good question. Um, you know, one of the things that we pride ourselves in in the School of Physical Sciences is we teach the fundamentals. And so one of the things that I think uh, is true that is if you teach folks the basic science at a fundamental level, then a really good position to adapt to changing technologies and to changing approaches over time. So that's one of the key things that we stress is that if you understand basic mathematics, basic physics, fundamental chemistry, and the fundamentals of earth science, that puts you in a really strong position to adapt to anything in the future as sort of this whiteboard problem. So that's kind of number one. But number two, we're certainly very interested in making sure we're keeping pace with what's needed today. So for example, this machine learning nexus that we created, 
we're bringing to, we actually have short courses that are created on the most recent advances in AI and machine learning that are available to all of our graduate students and even undergrads that they can just take for free to get them up to speed when they walk in the door and as they progress. So these are things we're trying to adapt in real time. Fortunately, we have faculty who are, who are keeping up with this stuff and are able to sort of then work with the students. And another thing is if you create these learning communities, the students can teach each other. Uh, and a lot of times there's that demand uh, that's happening. So for example, we're developing uh, the first of its kind uh, of minors in quantum science in both chemistry and physics as we're building up this element quantum institute. Uh, so this is something that we're really excited about. And um, again, this is driving new technology forward in that area. So thank you so much for that question. Um, okay, do we have any other questions that are jumping in? Um, any scientific guess on when your outstanding Tuesday morning breakfast um, uh, School of Physical Sciences session will resume? Um, uh, let's see, Sonia, do you have an answer for that for me? <laughs> I can give you what I think, but uh, we're it's sort of the team that has to put these things together. Sonia, do you have any comments of where we are right now with the breakfast lectures? Are we ready yeah. to talk about that? You know, we would love to resume our breakfast lecture series. Unfortunately, um, you know, given the COVID um, situation, we are holding off for a bit longer, but we promise as soon as possible, we'll, we would love to see you back in person. Yes, I, I would agree. And we have, exactly. So we're limited a little bit by, well, a lot by COVID. We're not gonna be doing these things in person until we can go live in person. Um, in the meantime, we have done these online activities like this. So one of the things we're aiming to do uh, when we relaunch uh, the breakfast series is to actually move the physical locations over here closer to where we are in physical sciences and to hold them in the new interdisciplinary science and engineering building, which is a fantastic, uh, amazing space uh, where we have space to do these kind of talks but also you'll get to see and sort of look around and see everything we're doing. Like this building behind me, you know, this is Crowell Hall. It's a gorgeous building. It's actually right across the quad from the new uh, uh, science and engineering building. And so you'll be able to sort of see it and kind of live and breathe the air, you know, around here uh, and sort of get a sense of really what's going on. So that's one of the things I'm really excited about with the new breakfast series. Um, when we relaunch it, it's gonna be over here in physical sciences and, and not in the student center most likely. So um, anyway, so thanks for that question. Uh, I thought it was gonna be a harder question <laughs> when I started reading it. Uh, so I did, uh, that was helpful. Um, okay. Um, all right, everybody. Um, I think that we are running out of time. Um, if there's any last questions, please feel free to, to ask them. Or if you have something for me that I wasn't able to answer sort of live in front of everybody, shoot me an email. I'm really happy to engage on anything. Um, I know we've got, uh, alumni and community supporters, but also faculty and staff on this line. And if you have any questions for me uh, about anything, you know, I'm, uh, the door's open. So please do, please do ask them. Let me just close by saying uh, what a tremendous honor it is to be able to talk to you about the school and be able to help enable the success of folks in the school doing so many important things. Um, I, I do think this is the best job that anybody could have because half of what I have to do is learn about all the amazing things and talk about them um, and then get to learn from everybody in this school who's so tremendous. Um, so thanks for this opportunity to get to talk a bit tonight. Um, I really hope the next time we do this, we're going to be doing it in person and I'll be able to see everybody and, and hear from you directly. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. I hope you have a fantastic night. Bye-bye. Um,